Hello and welcome to Irish Opera Podcast. This podcast is made possible by Blueberry.com. If you're thinking of starting your own podcast, get your first month of hosting for free with offer code Irish Opera, capital I, capital O, no space. If you'd like to support this podcast, head to patreon.com forward slash Irish Opera Podcast and subscribe from as little as a dollar a month to help us cover our costs. You can also make a one-time donation by emailing us at irishoperapodcast at gmail.com if you'd like to donate via PayPal. There are a few operas coming up. The Magic Flute runs at the Gaiety until Saturday the 25th of May. Bath's chamber opera The Sleeping Queen takes place on June 1st at 3pm as part of the Blackwater Valley Opera Festival at Lismore in Waterford. Don Pasquale by Donizetti will have three performances on Wednesday, May 29th, Friday, May 31st and Saturday, June 1st. Today I'll be talking to Gavin Ring about Ethna, among other things. Ethna is an Irish language opera by Robert O'Dwyer and available on the RTE Lyric FM label. It was the penultimate opera produced by Opera Theatre Company and a video of the concert is available on YouTube. So check our social media accounts for links. A translation and notes can be found in the published CD. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to get the latest episode on your device. And follow us on social media. We are Irish Opera Podcast on Facebook, Irish Opera Podcast on Instagram and Opera Irish on Twitter. So let us know what you think and send us in any questions you might have for any of our guests, past or present. And now let's cut to Gavin Ring. So how are you? How are you doing? I'm very well, Kevin. Thank you very much. How are you? Good, not too bad. Thanks Good. for sitting down with me. Um, so first question, how did you end up getting into opera? How, how did you start it off? Well, I think my earliest memories of sort of classical music and opera would, have, would be maybe when I was four or five um, my grandmother was a member of the Radio Air and Singers in the 1950s, so she had an avid interest in all things classical music. So she was playing quite a lot of opera and classical music in the house when I was growing up. And um, But I think I really caught the bug when I first heard the Three Tenors, okay. which would have been <laughs> maybe around 1992 or 1993. I remember I always tell people this story. I, 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 I remember going up to Killarney yeah. um, with my mother for a shopping trip or something like that and yeah. she stuck this tape deck on and uh, I, I'm not sure what piece it was maybe it was Nesson Dorma or also Lemmy or something but I probably. remember <laughs> yeah probably you know but I remember being captivated spellbound by this particular sound yeah and uh, a few days later sure my mom tells me I was up in the bed trying to imitate the sound that these boys were making you know so um, yeah I think that's a, so there was always something you know, there from a from a very early age, yeah. and uh, I suppose then um, I started some formal instruction in classical music with a local piano teacher uh, by the name of Barbara Lineson. Uh, she's still there teaching piano. She's a mighty woman, and uh, uh, I had a lot of traditional music growing up as well. I would have started learning tin whistle in primary school, and uh, I learned traditional side flute and accordion. I did a lot of traditional singing. And, um, and did you do that right up into your teenage years? And yeah, right into sort of. Oh God, I, I suppose I suppose I, right up until I was eighteen or nineteen, really. I suppose I was in a little group actually. Yeah. And we did a lot of gigging around Kerry and Cork and bits of Limerick and things like that, and made a few bob out of it. Actually, I never had a summer job, apart from maybe I used to do a little bit of a turn in the bog or do a little bit of work on the on an oyster farm, but I had no sort of you know regular sort of job like most of my friends did my job was playing music at the weekends and pubs and singing and all sorts of things and so I've been sort of you know um doing that from the <laughs> from from very early early on um but uh but yeah so I I I suppose I started really kind of taking an interest in classical singing when I went to St. Finian's College in Mullingar yeah. and uh, that was uh, when I was 12 I got a scholarship there there's been a scholarship running there since 1970 okay. and um, actually a couple of people from my locality had already gone so we didn't know about it and yeah. it suggested to my mother that I apply for it as well because I, I suppose I had um, even as a young fella you know in primary school I had a reputation of being reasonably musical and I think people sort of wanted to wanted to see that 
uh, that talent was fulfilled or the yeah. potential was realised or whatever, you know. So I got this scholarship anyway to Mullingar and I think sort of everything kicked on from there really because I was exposed to a level of music making and uh, a level of music pedagogy, which I suppose in fairness, uh, I, I wouldn't have got uh, in Car Sabine. Um, yeah. It's nothing against Carsabine, it's just it's in you know, it's a rural outpost really sort of exactly. not really um close to anywhere other than Tralee or Killarney and yeah. just the resources weren't there really. I mean, notwithstanding yeah. a fantastic school that is there now at the moment and some yeah. brilliant work being done there. But I suppose St. Finian's had a long standing tradition stretching back, like I say, to nineteen seventy and there was a, a massive emphasis. The I suppose the idea of the Scola Cantorum, as it was called, yeah. or as and as it's still called, uh, was that um, a sort of a, a centre for musical excellence would be provided outside of your, your sort of the typical areas like Dublin, Cork, or Limerick. Yeah, and um, and of course it had exactly yeah. yeah, and of course it had the boarding element as well, which was which was very congenial. Um, so I was sort of in the thick of it from you know the ages of twelve to seventeen, and I started. You know, learning how to play the organ. Uh, I started learning piano uh, with Park O'Quinnigan, who's you know one of the country's foremost uh, piano teachers and pianists mm. himself. Um, I continued studies with on 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 flute as well. I kind of started studying classical flute before I went to Mullingar as well, yeah. and so I uh, continued with that. We had advanced musicianship and choral studies and all sorts of things. I mean, it was incredibly rich, varied education that I got. And uh, I suppose I was in an organ lesson, I think it was, with um, my or- organ teacher at the time, a guy called Shane Brennan. And uh, he, uh, part of the audition or part of the interview process for St. Finian's was that you would have to sing something. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to prepare, let's say, p- p- whatever instruments you played, you'd have to prepare some pieces, but you'd also have to prepare a song. So I was in an organ lesson anyway, yeah. with Shane and he said... Look, we're finished our bit of organ studies for today. Let's do a little bit of singing. So yeah. he started uh, taking me up some scales and arpeggios and things like that. And he kind of said, oh, this is kind of interesting. And he says, how would you feel about getting your voice trained proper? And I said, oh, yeah, I'd be interested in that. Yeah. And I kind of got the bug from then on because I started training kind of weekly then with Shane and learning how to, you know, really place the voice. My voice, my voice broke quite early when yeah. I was about 11 so at this stage I would have been 13 or 14 so okay um, you so you're know, kind of yeah. figuring out where the adult voice was going to yeah, go I mean many. at first he thought yeah, but, and I suppose he's been proven right he said, he said <laughs> I was a tenor and um, <laughs> he uh, so but a, a lot of my early instruction with Shane would have been about um, let's say really cultivating that idea of placing the sound um, uh, in this let's say the frontal kind of um, uh, in, in the yeah frontal mask yeah. and the nasal cavities and the facial cavities and stuff like that and and using your breath support system and stuff like that it was I mean I think we spent the first like six or seven lessons just humming yeah and just kind of getting getting that idea of where to put the where to put the voice and I learned an awful lot from him actually I have to say um purely in terms of what to do from a technical perspective and um as a young singer like um. Mm-hmm. And then did you go straight into uh, singing for your undergraduate or did you do something? Well, no, I, I suppose I started doing the fesh as a young fella then, like doing things with like the Paul Deegan and things. You the right passage exactly, around here. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and that kind of, uh, and I, I suppose I started singing at events in the college as well and um, I started doing concerts at home. And I, I, I suppose because I had this early love for it anyway and yeah. early sort of enthusiasm or interest in opera singing per se... Uh, this was sort of a, a dream come true in a way because I was able to start actually properly singing in that yeah. sort in 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 that way. I suppose I'd never been I'd never done that before. I'd I'd have only done traditional singing, you know. Um, so it was great to finally start kind of doing that and doing it more and more and more. And uh, I, as I say, I learned an awful lot with Shane. I mean, we did a lot of leader, did a yeah. lot of song, and um, and that was brilliant for a young singer as well because, you know at 14 or 15 you're not going to be singing like big baritone or big no, no. or whatever you are so you know you just you have to at find your peril <laughs> exactly although I will say I think when I was um, uh, he did give me something that was a li- that was completely inappropriate at one stage he gave me um, I think I was 15 he gave me Di Provenza oh, right. from um, La Traviata you know German, German, German Pears area 
And I remember actually I entered it in the fish uh, for the Paul Deacon Cup and um, uh, the adjudicator, a Scotsman by the name of Eric von Nibbler, he'd, have, he'd have an oh, exotic yeah. name. I think he's but been actually, over fairly yeah, recently. Yeah, he, he, does, he does quite a bit of adjudicating, but yeah. well, part of his style is to go through each competitor and give them a critique yeah. in public. And of course, he got around to me and he just lit on me. Absolutely like, tore me to shreds. Why are you doing this for, at 15 for, <laughs> Absolutely. And, but I suppose the other thing about it is when I was singing it, I had an aw- I had fierce nerves back then. And what ha- used to happen is that my right knee used to start to buckle on me. I have the same thing. You have the it same just thing. Yeah. Just starts going. Yeah. And I remember actually the first time I ever sang in public, like properly in public, um, was uh, it was we used to have things called St. Finian's Day Mass. And... Uh, um, they asked if I would sing Ellis Island because it was 2001 yeah. and it was just after the attacks uh, for, on, in, at, of the, at the World Trade Center yeah. in 11 and um, we had quite a few uh, Americans actually in our, in our, in our school so yeah. we kind of felt that this might be a, a nice um, uh, homage or, or commemoration of, the, of that uh, awful event so we I prepared that piece Ellis Island I think it was written by Brendan Graham I'm not sure but anyway um <laughs> Uh, yeah I, I went up and I remember there being like a lectern there and I was thanking my lucky stars that there was a lectern because actually I was able to hold on to it because if you'd have had x-ray vision you'd see my legs yeah. just going from under me because I was so nervous and this is the sort of a thing that I only really got over when I was about maybe 20 or 21 and I, for years it plagued me. So I annoying. discovered that it's kind of, it's not even necessarily just nerves. Sometimes it can be just adrenaline. Yeah, and it, absolutely. It's just that yeah. shake yeah. and you can't, it's so hard That's to like... That's what it is though. It probably down. is yeah. adrenaline more than anything. But anyway, yeah, so I was in, in, in this fish competition yeah. where I was singing Di Provenza. Of course, the knee started to go and I had seen a video maybe... Oh, couple of weeks beforehand of Dietrich Fischer Disco singing some leader and he used to sort of lean on the piano oh, so yeah. I said to myself in the middle of Di Provenza as I was doing this I was like oh my god the knee's going to go for me I'll just do a Fischer Disco and I'll <laughs> lean on the piano and of course your man thought this was crazy stuff as well but anyway long story short he listened to me said should we sing this repertoire at your age blah 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 said, you know it's, 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 it's just not it's, and I think I cracked all over the shop as well I think it was, it was a disaster of a performance a disaster of a day but, but um, I mean, that's what fetch is for. It's all a learning course, curve. Of course, absolutely. I mean, it's sort of, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, you probably, I mean, modern day pedagogists would probably question the um, the sort of uh, <laughs> how healthy it is to be placing yourself in um, in such a psychologically fraught environment from a, from a young age. But, um, but certainly, but you know. It you makes you stronger. <laughs> there is a little bit of that, you know, it's, but it's, which, which I suppose can be, could, could could be viewed as a bit draconian and a bit Victorian, but uh, certainly for me, I have to say it was it, it it was great. And I think I mean I touch on this quite a lot. A great thing for me in terms of um, kind of dealing with the uh, the psychological intensity of both the career and what you do from an artistic point of view, it was actually the fact that I was quite sporty as a yeah. as, as a as a teenager, and I used to play a lot of Gaelic football, and I used to do a lot of rowing, and and I suppose I got into the I had the co- the concepts of sports psychology. I I used then in nearly every, every aspect of my life, and I continue to do so. Particularly when it comes to this, because in a way, opera singing and is is quite it's quite um, the parallels between it and sport being both being sort of performative acts yeah. and performative acts under you know a lot of the time extreme pressure. Um, can it's it's very helpful to actually to to have that conceptuality to be able to say well look you know i will i'll I'll use my my knowledge of or let's say the way i would prepare for uh, a football game or the way the way i would prepare for a rowing championship in the same way that i would you know uh, prepare for uh, a concert or a or a or a a role that i was doing or something like that so yeah yeah, um i think that was uh that was very that was very helpful and particularly with the fish because the fish is like it's a sport that's what it is yeah you know those competitions and you know you even have there are people who go to the fish fish year in year out and they have their little books and they literally study the form as if they're at Cheltenham you know <laughs> so I mean that 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 whole sort of kind of environment exists there yeah. so it's um 
So definitely sports is very, hen- very, handy, very handy in getting me through <laughs> that. I mean, I, f- I think I finished doing the fashion in 2011 and I, it was like the greatest relief. Like yeah. when I knew I had, when I knew <laughs> that I would never do the fesh again, notwithstanding how amazing it is and yeah. what fantastic support it was. And like, I mean, I, so I, I, mean I won a lot of money at the fesh that yeah. got me through some serious sort of, uh, or brought me over some really, really important bridges. But just the intensity of it. I yeah. mean, any singer in Ireland will know that it's um, it's both it's it, it's both thrilling and terrifying. Yeah. So it was nice to get the terrifying part out of the way. Absolutely. So then you went on to the academy to do to study with Mary Brennan. Or? I did. A, I made a little bit of a detour actually. When I was fifteen or sixteen, I said I wanted to be a primary school teacher because I sort of I, I the idea of becoming a full time singer never really dawned on me. And I suppose I came from a, a kind of a an environment or a family where like you know the solid job was really yeah. you know, kind of uh, and appreciated e- even aside from that like yeah. in Ireland of all places to be a full time singer it's it, like yeah it just doesn't years, sort of compute really no. <laughs> you know and lots of people sort of, even even today you still get the question you know you might be in a taxi you know you say oh yeah. what do you do I'm an opera singer and they say oh uh, what do you do during the day it's like <laughs> I'm an opera singer. I'm an opera singer. <laughs> I resorted now to just telling people I'm an accountant or a doctor or something like that. Just they don't ask more questions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Particularly if you say accountant. That's no disrespect to my own accountant, but if you say accountant, that's a conversation stopper right there. Um, but um, yeah, so I, 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 I said, I said, I, I, I looked at. I see my my two. I knew at my two big passions at that particular point when I was fifteen or sixteen was you know sport, Gaelic football primarily, yeah. and singing, and, and music. And I said, if I want to be able to start to do do both and have an income at the same time, primary teaching is a particular was was an ID yeah. vehicle because you're finished at whatever it is three or half three, and you might have you're to do some for the summer, correcting yeah. or yeah you've got there's yeah. there's there's room there to do extra stuff yeah. that other careers may not start to provide. Uh, although maybe you know these days I mean I know plenty of people who are in teaching profession and like it's just it's it's crazy the amount of paperwork that they have now and stuff like that like the the, the, the extra time that they have it's becoming yeah. less and less and less but anyway that's 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 another another, another story <laughs> but um yeah so I, I went to Pat's then after my leaving cert and uh, originally I was going to go to Mary I but uh, I started I started studying with Mary Brennan in my final year in Finians. Okay. Um, she was recommended to me actually by a couple of people. It says and and Finians because I was on the scholarship paid for my lessons with her and everything, which was yeah. fantastic. And so I started studying with her, and because I started getting on well with her, and I started you know I won a couple of fish competitions with her and things like that, and th- she seemed to be very enthusiastic about me, and yeah. she, you know she started then even at that stage sort of you know planting this idea or the seed of well you know you could become a professional singer. Yeah. Um. So I changed my CEO from Mary I. Uh, so Pat became my first choice, and Mary Mary I was my second. So I got Pat's, which was great, and that allowed me to study privately with Mary throughout the degree that I did in Pat's, and uh, and it was great in a way, kind of doing the education thing, because actually, you know, as an opera singer, um, so much of what you do is pedagogical. Uh, I mean. Personally, I have done quite a bit of mentoring and I try and do master classes and I try to impart as much of my own, even even at this stage, kind of because I'm only, I'm only 31, so I mean the amount of knowledge that I would have wouldn't be as much as, let's say, someone like who might be another 10 years down the line. But yeah. I like the idea of giving back and that's not saying that's not me saying, oh, aren't I great or anything like that, but I, I do like this notion of, well, I've learned something and I want to pass it down to maybe somebody else who, who's showing a bit of interest or flair or yeah. whatever for the art form. Um, so having done a teaching degree and having studied sort of pedagogy, I have to say as well, in Pat's, the head of music there, Mary Doherty, she was fantastic because she sort of, she knew in her heart and soul that like, I was never going to really step into a classroom or certainly if I was, it would have been definitely well down the list in terms of choices. Yeah. Um, so she sort of gave me as much performing experience as I got. I remember like the first year that I was there. I did like a Mozart Requiem yeah, and did the bass solos and that. And I remember the following year we did a Haydn creation and I was always doing kind of, you know, stuff with the chapel choir. And like, I remember she gave me an opportunity to conduct as well at one stage. I remember we conducted like Mozart Stuber Symphony and Beethoven Symphony Number no. 1 and stuff like that. And it was because with the education degree, then you could take two, in the first year you take two academic subjects. So I took music and French. 
And then obviously I just took music for the rest of the degree, the degree then. So I actually, as far as music's concerned, I had a really, really good grounding in Pat. So some fantastic teachers like John Buckley was my composition teacher. Rona Clark was my, um, um, one of my music history teachers. Sean McLean was another music history teacher. Uh, and Marion herself was fantastic. So yeah, it was a... It, it was a really good and then on top of it like having had the experience of studying pedagogy was really helpful then going forward as a singer so after as soon as I finished Pats I was like right that's it I want to go and study uh, singing full time and yeah. Mary had finished up in the DIT and she'd gone to the academy and I'd started studying part time in the academy in my final year in Pats and uh and the, the idea of maybe doing the Masters in the Academy came up, so I applied for it, got it, and thankfully, because the, it, the Masters is not inexpensive at the yeah. Academy, I, had, I, I got a Bank of Ireland Millennium Scholarship, which allowed me to pay the, pay the fees. Brilliant. And then I was on the OTC and Artist Programme, and I was doing stuff with Lyric Opera, and I was doing little bits and pieces of Opera Ireland, and down at, uh, at Lismore Festival or Blackwater Valley Opera Festival, yeah. as it's known. And like, the OTC Young Artist was brilliant, actually, because at the time, Annalise Miskimmon was like, gone, you know, she's shot into stratosphere, sort of directorial um, status at this stage in the world. Yeah. But she was the artistic director of OTC at the time. Okay. And... Uh, there was a few. There was a, there was a good bunch of us there actually. So there was William, myself, Claudia Boyle, Dean Power, um, who else? Uh, Rachel Kelly. There was a, a sort of there was a group there of really good singers, and yeah. we were sort of given lots of opportunities and lots of experience, and we were sort of just thrust into things. And you know, I mean, sometimes we were a disaster, but more 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 often than not, um, you know, we pull things off and got great value out of them and uh and someone like Annalise was brilliant because she really instilled um I suppose many of the realities of the business yeah. uh, into us and what should be what is it would be expected of us but more importantly what we should expect of ourselves and cultivate a high standard of artistic and professional integrity um, she was brilliant from that point of view and uh, and then that in tandem with my studies in the academy I mean Kathleen Tynan was marvellous I mean I, I, we did two full scale operas at the time I remember I did a, con I did a, I did a couple of Mala concertos as well and I just I just I got this incredible like in Ireland it was, it was amazing actually because I went off to study in the studio in London in 2012-2013 yeah. and like the amount of experience I'd amassed in Ireland yeah. uh, up until that point was incredible like yeah. all the on stage experience I had all the let's say orchestral experience I had like it was it was really really good like compared to an awful lot of, let's say of the my um, people yeah let's yeah. say who would have studied no not not, not in DIT but like in, in, in Britain in Britain yeah you know yeah. let's that's say people sorry, coming from oh yeah 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 like people coming from um, the, from the college, college or the academy like they might have had only maybe one role in yeah. like five years or something like that whereas I was coming with this literally bags of stuff and I, I remember I was on at Wexford here as well in 2010 I did an audition for, for Wexford and I was asked to do the course and stuff like that and that was that was mind blowing Yeah. so I had this like you know from let's say 2009 or 2008 from when I finished my degree in Pats right up to let's say when I started the studio which would have been 2012 I packed or certainly a lot was packed in in yeah. Ireland for me at that point and I remember I did like Steuermann in yeah. Fergus's first um uh, venture with wide open opera I me mean, did Tristan and uh, I mean that that was an amazing experience as well and I was I did some stuff with Glass Tool and there was just yeah. I just got people put so much faith in me and yeah. just gave me just said yeah you can do that you can do this you can do that and like crucially what that provided me with was a sort of a platform to make mistakes yeah a platform obviously to get experience but a platform to sort of find my feet as a yeah. performer and see what I could and could not do and um and within a sort of a safe environment and i'd say one thing about like the the overall sort of opera community in ireland i've i personally found it's so supportive and yeah. people like that if you have any bit of sort of get up and go about you and you really want you want to work hard at it people will rally around you and they'll, they'll try and they're like and because there isn't the sort of same formal structure in terms of education and profession the, the profession as there would be let's say in Europe or, or, or Britain because mm. it's a little bit more fluid yeah uh, you know 
you find yourself people will bend the sort of those yeah. boundaries for you to make things work for you and things yeah. like that you know so well, I mean even yeah. even we were talking to Fergus back in January and the the whole company Irish National yeah. Opera is much more fluid uh, than most other theatres yeah. or companies around Europe yeah. and part of that is the fact that we don't have a fixed abode there's no house for it so yep. it can do the smaller productions it can do the contemporary productions that won't bring in maybe a thousand people or whatever because it has a flexibility about what it does and where it goes and that yep. kind of thing so it, it is a very different kind of kettle of fish I think, yeah I mean here. there's pro, there's pros and cons with that like obviously but I think yeah. I think for the I think you know you have to cut your cloth and yeah. in Ireland I think that really works it, and, and and when it works it works exceptionally well um, and I mean we all sort of come back to this Casper uh, Holton who's um He's currently, uh, he was the director of opera at Covent Garden for a few, up until a year or two ago. I think he's in La Monnaie you now in, in Brussels. I'm not sure. He's, he's, he's somewhere anyway, either in the Netherlands or, 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 or Belgium, I'm not sure. But he's, um, uh, he basically said that Ireland is one of the most exciting places in the world to create mm-hmm. opera. And that fluidity l- lends itself tremendously to that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I experienced that like right at the cold face, hands yeah. down. Um, that and and I suppose if you're willing to work with that, if you're if you're if you're willing to say, right, I'll make the best of this and just and go with the flow, it it it's it's an incredibly sort of artistic and prof- artistically mm. and professionally sort of profitable. Yeah. Um, to, to 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 be involved in that sort of a situation. Um, you mentioned a minute ago that you were in the opera theatre company, mm. uh, young artists. And uh, about a year or so ago, I was learning uh, The Sleeping Queen by Balfe. Oh, and yeah. so Una Hunt gave me an archive recording of uh, an opera theatre company yeah. uh, version of it. And you were on it. <laughs> um, uh, was it Una's um, Irish music that actually started you off on your research with uh, Ethna and all of that side of things? I mean, that, co- that concert that we did in 2008, I mean, it must be like, you know, the way in Back to the Future, he's... November 5th 1955 is like that sort of you know crux in the space time continuum well as Where far nothing as nothing change or something yeah <laughs> but like well as far as Irish opera is concerned or let's say um, the re- resurrection of forgotten Irish works is concerned that concert in 2008 that we did or something we did two of them and we recorded them um, where we did The Sleeping Queen bits from Ethna bits from yeah. The Veil vale Prophet like they sort of they were all there and like I mean that, that was sort of the nucleus where an awful lot of these incredible projects sort of sprang f- uh, or sprang forth uh, so yeah I think that like wh- I remember when um, we were asked to do this uh, I think uh, so Una sent us over the scores and we were like you know it was another OTC gig Young Artist gig great and originally we were going to stage them actually but the budget didn't allow for it at the time so it was just going to be a concert performance yeah. with piano and record them at the National Library and etc etc I suppose when I first saw the, got the music I didn't think much of it I was like alright here's another sort of gig you know yeah, yeah, yeah. learn the music and, and go on with it but then obviously I am a fluent Irish speaker so yeah. when I got this piece by Robert O'Dwyer or the Ethna excerpts I was like wow this is incredible I've never, I didn't even realise anything like this ever existed so yeah, I mean, it sort of it it definitely it, it lit a spark that when I came to do my doctorate, I remember someone saying to me, "Well, if you're when you're picking a thesis subject, make sure you pick a subject that you like." Mm. So I kind of went over and over sort of different areas, and I all I knew I wanted to do something with regard to music in Ireland, and it, after a couple of weeks, at a sort of eureka moment, I was like, well, "Why don't I do something on ethna?" It, nothing has been done on it other than yeah. let's say we did perform those excerpts but yeah. you know I mean Axel Klein Harry White um, and a few others had written some stuff on the piece itself but uh, Joseph Ryan another musicologist uh, but nothing sort of really kind of uh, solely focus on the work mm. and of course then I started reading and I found that like there was not just one but there were like three in particular and one by a guy from my hometown yeah which was bizarre. really rad I remember actually I was in a rehearsal for a lyric opera and I was reading I was in, I was in, it was I wasn't needed or whatever and I was reading through the article on my iPad and I saw this you know this piece called um, Murgish yeah uh, which was composed by um, uh, Thomas O'Brien uh, Thomas O'Brien Butler and he said but no it was born in Carcevine in November 1862 and I says what 
What? <laughs> Kidding me? The chances. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and then I was like, "Red, well, I this has to form my. This is this is it. I mean, I have to. I have to do this. This is sort of divine providence in a way that this yeah. is this is my subject area." So that's where I started looking at the ethna. Originally, I wanted to do the three. I yeah. wanted to t- sort of, you know, uh, reinvent the Irish ring. Yeah. Because you have this Irish ring out there that's sort of disingenuously kind of called so because you've got, what's it, the Bohemian Girl, Lily of Killarney and Wallace's Maritana. Yeah. And like, apart from the fact that the title of the Lily of Killarney has some you know connection to Ireland the three works in question have no real base I mean there, yeah. there's no connection to Ireland I mean they're just they happen to be by Irish composers yeah. but they're not actually I, there's I, like I, a tenuous I don't want to sound sort of fascist about it either say oh they're not Irish because they don't have like diddly eye and this that and the other yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, like they just bear no sort of relation really to a kind of a contemporary Irish context yeah. you know or you sort of you know be you know, kind of, um, you know, I, let's say, native Irish or Anglo Irish or or otherwise or anything. There's no yeah. connection there. So, I, and lots of musicologists would have had issue with that particular kind of, um, uh, with those three works being dubbed the Irish ring. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I was saying, oh yeah, that's what I wanted to do, and um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the scores for uh, Murgesh and the other piece, which is by um, Jeffrey Molyneux Palmer, the orchestral scores, weren't extant. I mean, um, Thomas O'Brien Butler, he died on the Lusitania and yeah. he was actually coming from America uh, promoting the opera and uh, presumably he had the score with him and the score went down with the yeah. ship. So that's it's lost. That's, uh, yeah, it is, unless you want to do a, a recreation of some description. But... And the modern new Palmer, I'm sure, is somewhere. Yeah. Probably in somebody's attic gathering dust that just needs to be found because what actually what happened in 2012. Some excavation needed. <laughs> well, I started my doctorate in 2010. And um, so, I, and I was sort of, for the first sort of two years, 18 months, and you know, all you're doing is reading. I, yeah. mean, I mean, you read all the way through it, but that's the majority. When you're just gathering your literature and you're trying to find out your subject. But lo and behold, in 2012, the orchestral score for Etna became just uh, uh, arose from the uh, from the ashes so to speak it was yeah. found in some nun's house in Torlis or something like that <laughs> yes. and um, fantastic enlightened moment the National Library purchased the score so it was there it was available yeah it was available so uh, that kind of made everything possible then in terms of doing that particular opera so I decided to focus my research then on doing that because yeah. that was I mean I'm um, one of the big things about the doctors in the academy is this idea of performance musicology or this idea of performing performance and musicology being sort of symbiotic mm-hmm. and you would start to think to yourself well duh like they, one cannot exist without the other yeah um but actually if, you know for a long long time as i'm sure you know like that you had this there was a there was a very positivistic attitude to musicology and that it was a sort of a um a study in itself a science in itself uh, that it was actually uh, removed from the performance environment. Yeah. Um, and, and there are arguments for that. And, you know, I mean, they're not without their merit. Um, but I, I personally, I believe that um, true musicology or certainly, you know, empirical musicology is one that is informed by performance and, true, and, and empirical performance is one that is informed by musicology, that you have this symbiosis going on. So that was the idea that we I would do this musicological work on Ethna with a view to making sure that it was performed again. Yeah. And of course, I told Fergus about it, I think it was in 2014. So I was about two years away from completion. Yeah. And uh, he was... He was he couldn't believe that this thing actually existed. Yeah. And this was right up his street because Fergus is obviously so passionate about opera in Ireland. He's so passionate about growing the art form, um, not only in a sort of contemporary context, but obviously looking back to it to I wouldn't say that we have a heritage like, you know, we don't have a heritage like France or Germany or Italy or anything like mm. that. But we do have incidences yeah. of where certainly the fervor and the passion for the art form, there's there's there is a, there is an historical sort of uh, uh, chronology that of of instances where you have that um uh, these these sort of uh frissons frissons of um of irish operatic endeavor and uh and i think that's very important actually in a modern context with irish national opera modern irish uh, irish national company mm. um that not only are we cognizant of let's say creating you know new works and creating um you know a, a new uh 
sort of tradition of Irish operatic composition. But it's important as well to look back as to what Ireland did achieve, uh, and an, an awful lot of the time that isn't recognised. Yeah. Uh, um, it suffices to say the majority of the time is not recognised. So. Um, yeah, so Fergus, anyway, he was obviously artistic director of OTC at the time and wide open, so he was sort of an I- ideally placed to be able to sort of make this a reality from a practical point of view. And I suppose one thing led to the other. We applied for Arts Council funding. Um, I did work on the vocal score. Uh, he enlisted, I think it was his sister and Owen Desmond as well. And between the whole lot of us, we got we the um and we had we, we got an orchestra score and a vocal score and we were ready to perform it and then the arts council fortunately gave us the money that we needed to be able to put it on and it was just it was one whirlwind to the next and I really can't believe actually that we're in a position now to say that Ethna has been performed and recorded and it's there for posterity yeah and wow what a recording I mean like Robin yeah. Trichler or Orla Boylan I mean it's just it's it's yeah. it's incredible I mean to, to say and that available I, free on YouTube by the way exactly exactly <laughs> and to say that I had some part in that and you know that I was a cog in that in that machine is 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 an incredible source of pride for me and I I I I, I know I will look back, let's say, when I'm old and grey and full of sleep and I'm 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 on my I'm on my retirement. That's the <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. I par- yeah, yeah, I I borrowed that. But when I'm on my retirement Lilo, hopefully somewhere in the south of France or something like that, I look back on that moment as a as a huge high point in, in my in my in, in my in my musical life. Can you tell us a little bit about O'Dwyer? Because he wasn't actually born here, but he was born to Irish parents, wasn't he? So That's right, yeah. He was born in Bristol to Irish parents, I think in the 1860s. I can't remember exactly now. Yeah. Um, but you can read my thesis. It's online. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have all the information there. Um, yeah, and uh, I suppose, uh, yeah, both his parents were Irish. So he was very much brought up, and they were Catholics as well. So it very much brought up in this... Um, I suppose uh, notion of uh, Irish nationalism, or the no, or the the sort of the fervor of Irish nationalism, which of course was really started coming to the fore at the time, because I suppose you know the from the say the famine onwards, um, right up until nineteen twenty two, represents I suppose you know a huge shift in terms of um, uh, both the reimagining of Irish national consciousness. Uh, and I suppose it, it represents the period in which actually Ireland grew to achieve some form of independence yeah. from Britain or from, in, from, 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 from Great Britain. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was that, that whole period was a, a, a coming of age in terms of nationhood. Uh, yeah. So uh, O'Dwyer would have been very much of that era. And when he, sp- when he came of age himself would have been the early 20th century. And of course... From an from an Irish nationalistic point of view, culturally, artistically, socially, I mean that's where it's at. That's yeah. the that's the kernel and of be, everything. And a lot of uh, Irish opera was composed. I mean, there was Stanford, there was Wallace, mm-hmm. and all of that. But most of that was in the English language. Uh, yeah. Why was this one done in Irish? And but well, I think um, the notion of opera, you see, because I mean, when you look at like something like the Gaelic revival. Um, when, and its exponents like Hans Markovic and Douglas Hyde, in particular Hyde, I suppose the idea was to reinvent Ireland as a cosmopolitan sort of um, European nation, not so much uh, sort of as the kind of uh, the stage Irish kind of dancing mm. at the crossroads version of Ireland. I mean, that, which, which was very important as well, but that we were able to sort of assert ourselves in an international way. Yeah. And artistically at the time, opera was the vehicle for uh, the dissemination of national sentiment or national yeah. national um, national ideas, nationalistic ideas. Uh, and I suppose that was driven by people in the 19th century like Wagner and Verdi and then later by people like Puccini and Debussy and things like that. Um, so opera was very much seen as this, um, the, you know, it, the, the high sort of high art form that it was to be able to assert a particular... Um, uh, idea uh, particularly in terms of nationhood so the guys in the Gaelic League um, felt that you know we should be asserting ourselves that this should this should form part of our national expression in order to be able to again distance ourselves and set ourselves apart from Britain yeah uh, and uh, 
and very much sort of validate our own European international existence. And I mean, uh, and it even, does bring even, in the, yeah. sto- the mythology as well of Ireland totally. with Tiernan Og and all, all But of it was seriously considered at the time because even like, even let's say revolutionary figures as sort of hardcore as Terence McNeil mm-hmm. would have even, would, I mean, he was involved in many discussions with regard to the, let's say, the utilisation or, uh, or, the, or the growth of opera in Ireland at yeah. the time. And you had various people as well like John F. Larche and Michelle Esposito as well who were sort of trying to create this school of Irish art music composition yeah. um, which obviously was sort of very much in ta- like like the European tradition of looking back at let's say or the using traditional melodies and and, and driving them with you know, with, with, with modern modern art music yeah. um, so that was sort of wh- where they were trying to go with it and um, I suppose uh, O'Dwyer himself uh, he came back to Dublin in the 1890s and had gotten himself involved with Conor na Gaeilge and um, he uh, took charge and founded this uh, choir for the Arachtas Festival which was the Conra's annual and still is the an- their annual sort of showcase celebration yeah. and at the time uh, these uh, the Arachtas was I mean it was a it was a there were these sort of spectaculars of Irish culture so music, song, dance, mm. literature you know uh, and and opera as well it was a sort of a uh, it was a, a real kind of a, a drum beater for kind of Irish romantic uh, nationalism and um, and I suppose the Irish language obviously because obviously the Irish language was paramount to the reinvention of Irish national consciousness and you know, I mean, initially when, when let's say, the Conan Gael was, was formed and this idea of promoting the Irish language was uh, started to gather real traction, it was under this idea that the, because Ireland was divided by religion, because we were, um, because we were so polarised by Anglo, Gaelic, Protestant, Catholic, uh, that maybe the Irish language would be a space that, we could all occupy yeah. and that we could sort of come together under and that's one, that was one of Douglas Hyde's big ideas and yeah. unfortunately what well, I suppose uh, maybe naively so um, he, he that, that, that was thought that that, would, that might be the, the sort of common denominator but of course we know that you know the Irish language became the sort of common denominator for or the mother tongue of Irish nation, Catholic nationalism yeah. um, so it became a kind of you know associated with that but at the time it was sort of it was it was there was really an effort to try and 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 make it a kind of and again this idea of it being international not just colloquial or local yeah and uh and it could be recognized exactly yeah but also you know appeal to people abroad exactly i suppose the idea as well was i suppose like when you look at something like the reunification of germany yeah um that an awful lot of that uh sort of you know sprung forth from the fact that like you know um bavaria and prussia all, they all spoke german sort of thing this that you had this sort of common denominator in terms of language yeah. but anyway um so yeah so that was the, that was the driving idea behind sort of creating these operas and i mean it started with thomas, thomas o'brien butler uh, in 1903 and uh, that went okay but it wasn't didn't sort of make the statement that it that they intended to do and um O'Dwyer himself had been experimenting with different writers at the time yeah and uh and then the the Gaelic League asked him to write an opera uh for the 1909 Eroctus uh, and, and he agreed on the basis that I mean they found this the, this libretto the story and um himself and uh a really well known librettist or you know literary figure at the time, um, a priest by the name of um, Tomaso Kellig, mm. he who had worked you know closely with with Yeats in particular in his translation of Kathleen Houlihan, which is you know that real sort of milestone revival play. Yeah. Um, he would it, so it was kind of like a dream team in a way. Yeah. Like, so it and it was really him. successful. Yeah, I mean, the it was, yeah. reviews were very positive. Yeah. Um, they did actually compare him quite a lot to um Wagner or um, Strauss and Verdi. But um, uh, do you think that maybe that was partially because he had to write it so quickly that he maybe did imitate some styles? And oh yeah, put there's that no doubt about it. Like I mean, it's not perfect, and it's no. I wouldn't call it a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a very, very strong, musically strong work. Yeah, uh, it's dramatically quite solid as well, um, and there are some really incredibly, you know, 
fantastic moments in it from a musical point of view and I think you know it, it, look, let's face it it was his first opera yeah and any composer's first opera is not going to be their best and he only wrote two is that right uh, was it just wrote, this and Cleopatra Cleopatra yeah but he, he wrote a couple of, he wrote a one act thing called Cronin or which the, uh, the year or a couple of years before Etna um, he had been sort of and he wrote a load of sort of um, uh, cantatas and choral music and stuff like that so he'd been experimenting with the sort of with the medium for a long long time yeah. Um, but yeah I think you see again it comes down to the whole to the whole this, this question and it sort of it's, it's still relevant today about you know the Irish cultural imagination really accepting and sort of embracing the notion of opera yeah as a sort of a as, as our own thing I mean well actually yeah. there was one quote in your uh, dissertation which I want to read to people because I find this quite interesting uh, Charles Acton said the antique shop effect and the colonial effect have produced a folk attitude that international European art music is Anglo-Irish music whereas Saoirse Bodley's symphony is German rather than Anglo if it is centred anywhere but Ireland and anyway it sounds deeply Irish to continentals who know Ireland those who speak thus of Anglo-Irish music arrogate to themselves the expression Irish music when they mean Irish traditional music, as though Verdi had not written Italian music or Debussy French music. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting because I come from um, a traditional music background as well. Like I did trad music as a kid, did Irish dancing, all those kind of things. And it was always seen as other. No, that's not really Irish music at all. And if you said Irish music, you'd always be talking about trad music. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this is actually partly the reason why this opera hasn't been uh, performed in 100 years as well, is that they decided, oh, no, that's not part of our identity and we're going to move away from that. And it, it's kind of, it is kind of funny because they did, you know, bring in the Irish language for Ethna. You know, it was uh, Irish mythology. Like, it couldn't be more Irish in so many ways. Yep. But at the same time, it was abandoned and left behind. Yeah, you're, you've hit the nail on the head. That's basically it. I mean, that's uh, for me, that's sort of the, the essence of why we continue to have this sort of strange relationship with, um, uh, with classical music in Ireland. I mean... Uh, yeah, I you see. I think even from Brehan times, we've always had a kind of a music has always played second fiddle, if you'll <laughs> pardon the expression, to uh, to words or to prose. Yeah. Um, you know, even in even in let's say, in in, in as I say in old Brehan chieftain culture, like in a particular so let's say Brehan court or Brehan uh, sort of you know. Um, set up you would have had a bard mm. uh, who would have composed poetry uh, on a regular basis that would have been sort of like the court the court bard or whatever yeah. and uh, and you know any music that was uh, mu music was there to serve the word so let's say the bard would read this poetry and you would have been mm. a harp playing in the background or something like that uh, and so the music so the music was constantly informing the text, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, even that, like, that like art song, really. Yeah, but I way. suppose art song in a way is different because it brings the two, or certainly the uh, the goal is to bring the two on an equal footing. Yeah. Same with opera. I mean, you have that. You have that sort of. You have that. I mean, I did a piece last last summer in in in, in Garsington, which centers around that on that whole notion, vot or the tone, you know, words or music, which is more important. And certainly in Ireland, it seems that words have been more important. And that seems to be sort of in the Irish psyche. I think that plays a part as well. But certainly, um, I think the 18th century is a lot to, it, it does, the, we've a lot of, we've, has a lot to answer for. Yeah. Because obviously we had this, you know, with the instigation of the after the Battle of Kinsale and the sort of Tudor reconquest of Ireland, you had this sort of doubling down of, let's say, um, the Protestant agenda, yeah. the English Protestant agenda, and you had the intro introduction of the penal laws, and you had, you know, uh, and and these this went on for centuries, and you had this sort of you created this two tier sort of society where you know you had the Anglo Irish descendancy who were Protestant, and they were the landlords, they were the they were the they were the they were the people who were who were wealthy and uh, and and had you know sort of fluid social mobility and then you had this underclass of Irish native Catholic Gaelic 
sort of um, indigenous uh, population yeah. uh, who were essentially just subjugated for centuries. And that has an awful lot to do with it as well because in the 18th century you had this influx of classical music in Ireland uh, brought over, you know, vis-a-vis the, Irish, the Anglo-Irish ascendancy. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it, 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 in a way, there's no wonder that there is that sort of hangover from that era. And bear in yeah. mind that went on for a century that you had this sort of, well, that's what the Protestant English brought over. Yeah. And while they were enjoying that, we had our music and we had our traditional music. Yeah. And that was, and that in a way sort of copper fastened so much of this sort of idea, well, traditional music is real Irish music and there is no other sort of paradigm other, other than that. Never mind that we've all yeah. these other compo- composers writing all sorts of stuff, exactly. whether it be, you but, know, opera or it be Yeah, but anything. it's essentially that polarised context yeah. uh, of Irish culture, which has sort of, you know, really left music certainly art music in the Haytony place yeah. uh, you know let's say be it you know continental Irish or otherwise so it's, yeah. a, it's, it's, it's a treat I think that's become diluted now in the last number of years uh, last, particularly in the last 100 or, and, and more uh, specifically in the last let's say 40 or 50 that because Ireland's because our our nationhood now our identity is no longer bound up with this idea of well we hate England and we, yes. we're not English yeah our, our notion of, of self identity now is very much I suppose in a way what the original exponents of the Gaelic revival are in the Irish the Irish uh, the Irish cultural revival is intended was this idea that we were you know uh, our own people with yeah. our own sort of international uh, and and European significance and that that in a way I suppose particularly as far as art music is concerned is very important because we don't have to, we our 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 the our concept of ourselves are no is no longer underpinned by let's say the dichotomy of the of 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 you know Protestant English yeah. versus Catholic Irish you know yeah. so that's. That 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 whole. I mean, I'm not saying that it's Ident- not identity as there. opposed to rather than yeah. identity for yeah. its own sake. And we're, we're we, you know, and that I think I think in the next I think in a hundred years time, uh, you know, presuming that you know, Donald Trump doesn't press the red button, we all blow up in smoke, and <laughs> oh, global God. warming doesn't like completely. Well, that's probably dis- more likely. That's probably more likely. <laughs> But I think that I, you know, let's say notwithstanding those things, <laughs> I think that classical uh, art music, um, art music in Ireland will will more than likely be in a far more healthier state. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I mean, I mean, that's it's wishful thinking. Fair enough, because of the whole issue of you know whether art music is 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 relevant in modern culture and everything else. But anyway, that's a, that's another story. <laughs> but 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 one would like to think that conceptually we'd be in a far more o- open place to be able yeah. to accept it as something that is as much Irish as like the Rock of Cashel. Yeah. You know. Um, we did have one listener's question actually about like you know singing in Irish and how that's different. And obviously you as a Gael goer probably didn't have too much trouble with it. Yeah. But at the same time, there are a lot of sounds in Irish that you wouldn't really expect in the kind of classical or operatic style of singing there's a lot of guttural sounds Mm -hmm. and if we sing in German or if we sing in French we often adapt some of those sounds to make them further in the mouth so that you're not back in your throat or something like that Mm -hmm. were there considerations like that to be made for Ethna and I did read that you settled on the Munster dialect for singing as being Mm -hmm. better Um, why was that? Well I felt felt the Munster uh, just, just purely in terms of studying the languages I mean so in or sorry, the dialect. Yeah. So in Ulster and Connacht in particular, I kind of I didn't really look at Leinster because I mean because of the sort of the the nature of of Leinster as as a province, uh, being quite sort of anglicised yeah. over the years, would not necessarily have. Mm-hmm. There's no real discernible native dialect from that area. Yeah. Uh, whereas in Munster, Connacht, and Ulster, there are, um, and uh, in 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 Ulster and Connacht. You have quite a lot of schwa, and you have quite a lot of um, uh, what's known as superscript yods. Yeah. So you have these, uh, you have these y and w sounds, um, which um, which can be handy, but a lot of the time, particularly for non Irish speakers, can be quite difficult to sort of uh, get your head around straight yeah. away, or certainly get your mouth around straight away. Yeah. I felt that. The, the Munster uh, version in particular, that from, let's say, kind of the Kule Peninsula and Schlieb Lukra, that sort of area, um, there's, a, there's a real absence of that, of, of those sort of sounds. Or certainly they're far less intense, far less sort of prevalent 
I mean, they are there, but they're yeah. not. They're not in any way there in the same sort of uh, same richness. Um, so the auditory result of Irish down there is a little bit more uh, direct. Yeah. Um, so I, I give you an example. So like you know, uh, uh, so like even the word let's say uh, dinner. Yeah. So I would say dinner like that. Whereas in Connemara they might say dinier. The, oh, and the, yeah, so the, okay. the, the, the near, and there'd be yeah. a little bit more guttural sound and a little bit more sort of uh, widened larynx and yeah. things like that so and diphthong yeah and exactly <laughs> yeah so you do, I saw there's 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 just a there's a direct quality to, to Munster Irish that sort of lends itself particularly from a learning point of view yeah. a little bit uh, a little a, uh, makes it a little bit easier I, I that was that was my opinion yeah. and I suppose I based that around this idea of um, of of uh, particularly when it comes to um, uh, to realising sound in an operatic fashion, that, uh, you know, you want to give singers... The, the best best practice is to concentrate on pure vowels. Yeah. Uh, um, so, again, the Munster Irish would sort of lend itself a little bit more readily to that. Uh, but that's not to say that you can't, and that you can't, once you've got your... Got, got a group of it you can yeah. you can do whatever you like with well, I suppose it, really. the, the purpose of your thesis as well was really to prepare a score that could be used yeah, by, any, absolutely. by any kind of singer a lot of it? my discussion as well yeah. was theoretical I mean like uh, operatic studies in the Irish language I mean probably thus far are limited very limited words. probably just to, my to what thesis. you're doing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for now I think so, yeah. I think David Scott tweeted us the other day saying um, he's doing something on Wurgus at the moment Great. but um, God knows we'll see maybe there's more coming out of the woodwork we yeah. never know but it's um, great. But and there's nothing to stop contemporary composers of using Irish either <laughs> but you know I, I think I think I think Irish is a fabulous language to sing in operatically and uh for me, I mean, I, I, when I was at the studio in London, I, I, I studied uh, the role of Onegin. Uh, yeah. And um, I'll never sing that role now. Uh, <laughs> but I will sing Lenski. I know I'll sing that role. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, I remember going to... Yeah, to be Rock. announced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, to be announced. Secrets, secrets. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Cut, 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 cut that. Um, I I remember going to Russian coachings and like they say, God, they, they, you know the Russian coach so you 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 Russian is very good. Yeah. And um, sorry, it's a terrible Russian accent. <laughs> I apologise to the entire Russian community for my uh, horrendously stereotypical <laughs> and rotten uh, Russian accent. They said my Russian was very good, or the certain my my pronunciation was very good, and I found what I was doing was actually importing. Um, Irish, Irish sounds yeah. into it and actually I find the two it, from an auditory point of view or certainly from how would they physically fit in your mouth are actually very similar yeah. and, and, and Russian as well is full of pure vowels Russian yeah. is a beautiful language to sing in and I just think the two of them are very very similar yeah well, we're currently sit- sitting in the National Opera House and you just men- mentioned Lenski yeah. but uh, what you call it you were about to do your last uh, role as a baritone as Papageno. Mm-hmm. Um, this production actually has a lot of Irish myth kind of involved in it as well. So it's yeah, kind yeah. of thematically quite similar. Yeah, even yeah, yeah, yeah. Who would have thought we'd be jumping from O'Dwyer to uh, Mozart? But yeah, um, yeah. why do you think people should come see this particular production? I think it's incredibly well thought out. Yeah. I think Caroline, in fairness to the... And flute is not an easy piece to think out. It's so convoluted, that. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like, it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a can, can I curse? You can do whatever you yeah, want. It's a, flute's a bit of a shit show. <laughs> yeah. Not that it's a shit show, but yeah. it's, like, just crazy. It's yeah. like Monty Python it's, or <laughs> pantomime. It's, it's just sort of, you know... I mean, it was conceived in a kind of a way. It was kind of... You know, it was slapdash. Yeah. Throw any old story together, put wonderful Mozart music into it, and hey, you've got a show. Yeah. And I suppose an awful lot of it was driven. It was centered around the character Papageno, and the original Papageno was Emmanuel Schikaneder, and you know, mm-hmm. I mean, the he was an actor. Really. Yeah, he yeah. was, and he was the leader of this particular yeah. theatrical dramatic troupe. Yeah. Uh, and he owned, um, uh, he owned, he owned the theater in which this, uh, in which Magic Flute was. Um, uh, was composed for mm. and he was doing this kind of stuff time and time and time and time again and you know I mean there's a, there's an argument out there actually that had flute not been composed by Mozart that we probably wouldn't be doing it you know we probably would have been lost yeah uh, and so God knows what other wonderful pieces are out there as well like by composers who weren't as sort of or certainly prolific. Or, or <laughs> prolific as well known as Mozart yeah Um. so 
So yeah, so, so so dramatically presents a lot of problems for an awful lot of directors. But yeah. I really think Caroline has has has, uh, has hit the nail in the head with this one because yeah. um, she's thought it through. She's because we we have a sort there is a sort of a concept on it, and we have it sort of localized to Ireland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, there are an awful lot of very strong Irish themes going through it. The whole, particularly because sort of time frame is nineteenth century, so we have very much the presence of. You know the, the the powerful sort of quasi sinister imperial British landlord, yeah. Uh, and then you have you know the kind of the more uh, earthy kind of um, Irish characters, sort of indigenous Irish characters, uh, and uh, and and so that and you have this and it's I mean visually it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean the 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 set is one of the best one of the most beautiful sets I've seen in an Irish operatic production period and I've been looking at <laughs> Irish 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 operas enough, or Irish operatic productions for a long long time this is really tops it's yeah. it's, it's stunning um so I mean just from a visual point of view it's an absolute treat but yeah so it's really well thought out and uh there's a real naturalism there's a realism to this production which I have seen done. I have seen, or rather, I have seen attempted yeah. over the years, and it doesn't necessarily work because, primarily, I think because the director hasn't really thought it through. Yeah, uh, they might have slapped this big idea of a concept on us and say, and you know, uh, with the best will in the world, might have been a great idea on the overall. But if you don't work out yeah. every little corner yeah. of flute to suit what you're doing. You will run aground, yeah. and we we didn't run aground, and and you will run aground in the rehearsal process. Yeah. Fact, I've yeah. done a, I've done a few productions of flute now where that has happened. Yeah, and like and you've played you've played pop game. I times. have, yeah. yeah. So like I sort of, um, but this is this is this is totally different. Caroline came in yeah. with a plan from the start, knew exactly what she was doing, what knew how she wanted us to execute it. Yeah. So all of us are completely committed, completely on board, and believe in it one hundred percent, which is really quite something for flute. Yeah. Because as I say, it's it's just I mean, it's <laughs> mad. Mind melt. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. Like yeah. It, the whole thing is, you know, I mean I mean Flute will have, you will have. There will be unanswered questions anyway. There yeah. are plenty. There, there are too many goofs in the piece itself in order for you to be able to sort of completely tie up every loose end. Yeah. But don't get me wrong. It's, it, it, I'll tell you something. It won't be as bad as the last episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> put, put, it, put it that way in terms of in terms right? of bad writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh god, that last week's one. You mean? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was raging. and it was just like I know. I saw your tweet. <laughs> <laughs> it just went from zero to a hundred and I was like, ah, here. Yeah. Like, there's a whole season missing here of her going mad or something. But anyway, we dare not spoil it for everyone. No, no. But, um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, So it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's really well put together from that point of view. And, I, I mean, it's a, look, I mean, I know I'm in it, so I maybe, yeah. maybe I'm a little bit biased. But let's say, aside from the Papageno, yeah. I mean, the cast is unbelievable. It is, yeah. It's, it's great. It's stellar cast. It's international cast. Unbelievable. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, uh, it's, it's crazy what those singers, singers can do. And I mean, those mm-hmm. roles like Tamino and Pamina and Zarastro, they're, no, they're notoriously fiendish roles and yeah. will really expose a singer if they're not up to it. Yeah. But the cast that we have, including the, including the double casts, uh, mm-hmm. are, are, are really top-notch. I yeah. mean, it's... it's there are, I mean, I know we say this about so many Irish um, productions, and like we're very. I mean, me and you, Kevin, be very proud of our of 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 any Irish operatic achievement. Yeah. But I think this is really up there. Yeah. From a musical point of view, and I mean the ICO under Peter Whelan. I mean, it's it's it really it's music making of a really really high international caliber, and I mean like we always achieve a certain sort of percentage of that with every operatic show that we do in Ireland, and I think Irish National Opera has a really high bar, but I think this even exceeds those standards. Yeah, from a musical point of view, it's, Car- it's, yeah. Caroline's been working for years in Germany, yeah. and you know we all hear about like the mad productions, and you know we're going to do this opera on the moon or in spacesuits or all sorts of things. I remember Bruno Caproni telling me one time that he did Rigoletto in on the moon or on Mars or something, and I was like, oh god. But you know, has any of that kind of crazy crept in, or is it just for keeping magic the flute? elements of the fan- fantasy really? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's sort of. I 
no, I, I, I don't think, I, I, as I say, I think there's a real naturalness, a real realism to it. Um, mm. An awful lot of the scenes with Papageno even, um, I mean, at, at times I feel I could be, you know, doing a scene at the gate or yeah. in the abbey because uh, she wants us to infect the performance with as much integrity and yeah. sort of scrap away or sort of, you know, clean away the buffo and the, and the kind of, you know, junkular overacting, which is normally associated with traditional productions of flute yeah. uh, and sort of, you know, and distill it down to something a lot more relatable and a lot more and a lot finer. So, yeah. um, no, I, I, I don't I, I, I don't think this I think this is a this is a really novel, but real production of Magic Flute. Um, before we go, uh, you're going to be doing your debut with Wexford in two operas, I think, this yeah. uh, autumn. Yeah, yeah. So you're doing The Veil vale Prophet mm -hmm. and the second one is... Donkey Shot. Donkey Shot. Yeah. Yes. So um, how's your summer planned now in terms of <laughs> figuring out how to go from Papageno to these tenor roles? Oh, well, yeah, God, yeah, don't mention the war. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, 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 this is, so the Papageno, this is my last baritone role. Yeah. Certainly <laughs> for the foreseeable future. Whether I come back to baritone when I'm in my 60s or 70s, that remains to be seen. Maybe I'll play Domingo kind do of thing. Do a Placido <laughs> Domingo, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not quite sure I'd quite scale his height, but <laughs> who knows, who knows, who knows. Um, but uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I literally, 20, 28th of May is my last baritone gig. I do Carmina Burana with, uh, in Dublin and that's it and then literally a few days later I do Frederick in parts of Penzance in Cork I'm uh, doing a recital of tenor stuff at the Blackwater Valley Opera Festival I go off to Welsh then to cover um, uh, a fairly big tenor role in this um, piece by uh, Minotti called The Consul and uh, after that then I go to London I'm working with a little company in, uh, in Oxford and I'm just doing it's a little unknown opera by a guy called Stephen Starris who actually was Nancy Starris's husband who was the right. first Susanna in, yeah. the, in the Marriage of Figaro so this is kind of a, a late 18th century piece and I'm doing the lead tenor role in that which is great it's kind of tucked away out of the way but a nice healthy role to get me started yeah um, so I finish that up around the middle of July I get maybe a week off I do I'm going to be doing a, uh, an art song recording project a Gaelic art song yeah um, in, in August and then I start rehearsals for well I'm going to Disneyland then and France with my family <laughs> for a couple of weeks and uh, then I start rehearsals a for singer that gets holidays what's that I know yeah <laughs> well I'm sorry I'm a bit I'm a bit militant when it comes to my holidays I say to my I, I, I say to my agent I say I'm going to be off these two weeks and that's it and I don't yeah. care I don't care if the Met comes calling I'm off <laughs> and I've sort of I've always been you like you kind that. of have to when you have kids don't you at well, some point I, I mean, regardless whatever kids or not I've always been adamant that like there are you more have a life. yeah exactly there are more like don't get me wrong I love this career yeah I am so lucky to be able to do it yeah but there are other things in life yeah and particularly for me my wife my kids are incredibly important and uh you know, I suppose an awful lot of people in this career, you know, there's a clear prioritization sometimes of the career over everything else. Yeah. And fair, you know, fair play to them, that's fine, but that's not for me. Yeah. And I, I want to make sure that I tend to that side of my life as much as I do um, my, my professional side. So I literally say to Maxine, I say, those two weeks, not doing it. <laughs> so you pretty yeah. much no break after Fleet going straight into tenor reps. Yeah, so pretty much. Yeah, you're, you must be obviously preparing that repertoire now. I am. Um, yep. And how how is it how is it going? You know, performing baritone roles and trying to train the voice and get all of the muscle memory in the right place for mental. these tenor things. It's absolutely mental. <laughs> now I'm very lucky in the sense that Papageno, although traditionally sung by baritone, it's not. It's not low. necessarily voice dependent. Yeah. I mean, for example, Rolando Villazon did it last year. Yeah. So it's not uh, one of those roles that you absolutely have to be a baritone for. Yeah. Uh, so in in a way that has been a kind of a saving grace because it has meant it 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 it, it means it, it has meant that I can I can do tenor stuff. Yeah. You know, begin my I I mean I began my sort of transition phase you know back in October. Yeah. Uh, and it, it it has meant that I've been able to do that. Now, I, there have been a couple of moments in the last few months where it really has been like, you know, uh, I, call, I call it a what the fuck moment. <laughs> I was doing this John Passion in Copenhagen. Yeah. And uh, uh, 
So we were there for about three or four days and Dean Power actually was doing the evangelist. Oh, right, so yeah. Me and Dean are good old buddies now. Yeah. Interestingly enough, actually, from a purely technical point of view, it's actually the best I ever sang it. <laughs> but also because I feel actually since I started training, as a, since I've started training as a tenor, I feel I'm only really learning to sing for yeah. the first time. Because uh, I'm, I suppose for an awful long time I would have been. Well, you always had a good top, didn't you? Yeah, so kind of. But as a singer, I would always, I, I, I was always very sort of instinctual. So yeah. I, I would never have thought a whole pile about technique, yeah. other than a few sort of basic concepts um, that I, that I learned when I first started training with yeah. Shane Brennan. Um, everything else then was just sort of my natural sort of the natural biological physiological progression of my voice yeah i was kind of and i never did anything on too too unhealthy from that point of view from a sort of a vocal production point of view um but now because because i'm a tenor and because i have to really um make sure that i'm accessing accessing and using the extremity of my voice in a healthy manner i've had to learn things or certainly copper fasten and double down on things which I never really pay or which I never really gave as much emphasis to yeah. when I was a baritone but now I really have to and but it's amazing singing that John Passion and implying all those all those things uh, all those conscious things that I'm doing now as a tenor made singing that repertoire even easier again which was yeah. kind of you know I mean obviously look I I, <laughs> I kind of came away going Really? That's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the easiest I ever sang that. It was the best I ever sang it. What's going on? I'm supposed to be a tenor. <laughs> Literally two days later from that gig in Denmark, I was doing, I did a recital at Wigmore Hall where I did everything in the tenor key. Yeah. And everything, obviously, at concert pitch. And so that was a bit like, whoa. That was, like, that was, that was, that was. Change of gear. That was, that was very, very, that was very stressful. And I wouldn't recommend it. I got away with it, <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> So I am, from that point of view, I'm looking forward to kind of, don't get me wrong, I'm really looking forward to this um, magic flute and really just enjoying this last hurrah, so to speak. But it will be a great relief to finally close the book on the baritone chapter, so to yeah. speak. And a lot of new repertoire to learn. <laughs> but you know, yeah, people say that to me, but I suppose for the last 10 years, I've, I, I've learned reams of new repertoire anyway. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, I've done a lot of modern rep, so... Yeah. I so have, that's always I have to learn it anyway I mean an awful lot of the roles which I've done as well like when I think about it in Guglielmo I never I mean I did it, I did it in college but I never did it in English per se so I had to sort of relearn it for Upper North yeah something like um, well, that's it I suppose like the, when you yeah. translations of last year of Garsington yeah I, the role of Olivier as new rep Don G I never touched when I was at the studio so I had to relearn all that like so yeah. or sorry not relearn but learn that nice. so so new rep is not really a sort of thing I'm worried about because I mean I, you I suppose, learn on foot anyway I suppose the There's whole thing is that it's like yeah. it's supposed to get easier maybe 10 years down the road but it's it does it's not going to when you're kind of maybe changing up or whatever you're going to be learning and there more were, the, you know there's, there's very few singers out there now who sort of have like three or four roles and live off them yeah generally now singers are doing everything and anything yeah. you know just, and with like you know so much travel being involved in it yeah. as well now like you know even if you have done it before you haven't done necessarily the same translation of it or of whatever. course yeah, absolutely so. so you're you're always like you know I mean I mean like I say generally if you're if you're if you're a working singer nowadays and if you're lucky enough to be so learning repertoire and your repertoire is just that's just part of that's yeah. part of the business nowadays so yeah. you know as I say gone are the days where you can live off three or four roads I mean there are singers out there but they're getting less and less all the time yeah well we could talk all day we but and we'll could. probably be doing we, some we, drinking tonight and talking yeah, but yeah, yeah, we do yeah. have a show today so. <laughs> <laughs> alright thanks so much for doing this yeah, and uh, good luck with everything and uh, I'll see you on stage well Kevin thank you very much for uh, having me and uh, I'm very I apologise for uh, to your listeners now for the utter ramblings of my utterings <laughs> for the last hour and a bit or so. Well, that's what podcasts are for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.